the language of the universe. But I don't understand it. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Math and Physics Podcast. I am your host, Parker. And I'm Ray. And we welcome you back to episode number 102, where today we are going to be talking about magnetism. Almost as anticipated as special relativity part two. <laughs> oh, so interestingly enough, this is one of our, I mean, with special relativity, yeah, one of our most requested mm-hmm. episodes because we did an electricity episode a couple episodes ago. And it was just, a while ago. It was a minute yeah, ago. Okay, yeah, so yeah. A couple, couple episodes yeah. ago. And I just happened to finish my semester of electromagnetism. So now we can finally get into a little bit of magnetism mm-hmm. to kind of complete the electromagnetic or at least intro to electromagnetics yeah and for everybody that's waiting for our special relativity part two episode we're trying to get a professor who teaches general relativity here at u of t and so we're saving that for like a really good guest episode that will be because i think after a certain number of parts like there's only so much we can really talk about like after especially with like astronomy is like what four for like part four or something uh yeah like we've we've so. literally reached the end of our undergraduate studies in, in astro so <laughs> there's like, a lot for left know. for us to talk about though in astronomy. i guess right right we do yeah. have a lot of information cosmology we didn't really talk about anyways so first let's just break the quick bubble before we get into the new episode it's been a long time since yeah. we uploaded a podcast <laughs> yeah so we both finished our third year of university yesterday uh, we had a lot of work, and uh, so we had to just prioritize. A lot of days were spent just studying and uh, doing work and uh, writing papers and getting yep. ready for exams. And now that is all over, we are transitioning into the summer period where we also have more like academic things prepared, but it's going to be a lot less busy than mm-hmm. the school time. So we're going to do podcasts again. Uh, the thing is, we don't know if we're going to continue... Uh, uploading weekly i think we will try to but the idea is actually to like one week we prepare for the podcast and we like actually plan out what we're you know like the topics we're gonna do in what order and maybe write down a couple of things to say just because i don't know some people have been commenting on episodes saying that like we're really unorganized which (laughs) is true but i also at the same time i think it's like it's kind of fun how we just like think of things and talk about them. Right. Um, but yeah, it would be more um, mature of us, you know, coming into our fourth year, our senior year of university, maybe make the episodes a little bit more structured. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're thinking like one weekend we prepare the episode and the next weekend we record it and release it. And so we do like every two weeks, but maybe we'll have a lot of time and we'll be able to do it once a week. Yeah. Who knows? Right. Yeah. Who knows? We'll see. So, yeah, I mean, that's the update. Now Now that summer's in, also, we have got requests for, you know, things like merch, merchandising. Oh, yeah. And we can finally do it. And now we actually have time. Now, yep. I mean, I guess we keep saying this, but <laughs> now we le- legitimately do have time. Yeah. So, I mean, we can set it up right after this if we want to, like, really. So, yeah, yeah. we um, will be getting that done as well. So, the next four months, I think, will be very exciting for the podcast or yeah. just in the hopeful direction very very exciting yeah as always let us know if you have any uh requests like episodes that you want us to talk about Mm -hmm. um we're always looking for things to talk about uh usually uh we talk about things that we learn about in school and we do have a lot to talk about uh, in terms of like what we just finished doing yeah i think an episode about partial differential equations would be pretty fun talking about like the different types of equations like the motivation for like where the like general form of the equation really came from right like uh, wave equation heat equation also applies in a lot of physics yeah definitely so yeah we can can definitely do that too um anything else we want to cover i think that's it so we can continue on to the drum roll please comment of the week now unfortunately um it's not no longer comment of the week more like comment of the episode and here we have a lovely comment from zaris i'm sorry if i'm mispronouncing that 
But, oh, this is, wow, this comment was a month ago. So it's really been a long time since we last recorded. But they say, hey, guys, I discovered your, you recently through Google Podcast. You put me back on track after years of only caring about my career. You make me realize that physics is not only about studies, the fe but the feeling you get when you understand it is priceless. And then he talks about is the uh, how he loves us when uh, when we when we argue with each other as both opinions include their own truth but from different perspectives. <laughs> Keep it real. We are very experienced at arguing with each other. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that happens quite quite often. So thank you for your love and uh, yeah, thank you for that lovely comment. And as always, if you want to be next, I should say episodes comment of the episode, simply put it down in the uh, YouTube comment. Section. section and there it is that's all you really need Alrighty. Alrighty. let's get into magnetism magnetism so the first question that comes to my mind when i think of magnetism is is it magic <laughs> and i'm not joking because to most people when you see a magnet i think it's magic because mm -hmm. the fact that there is nothing in between that just happens to attract these two objects i guess together it's like gravity it's like gravity but on a scale where you can comprehend it because gravity sure. i guess you can see planets but you can't really you're like okay i think it's there i guess now we even know the gravity moon. isn't even a force right we know it's just it's just the, it's just the process but i mean it's just a it's just a result but in this case magnetism is a direct process that you can see happening and i think one of the even cooler things about magnets is that you keep breaking them apart and they continuously have their dipolar structure. Mm. That right? is also a very local explanation, though, in terms of time. What? Because in the future, right. hopefully, every type of dynamic situation will be explained by one thing, right? Like a grand unified theory of physics. And so we know, we know that the electro weak strong f or electromagnetic electromagnetic force strong nuclear weak are all three different aspects of the same thing and a really good um like visualization tool that i actually read from stephen hawking's book um a brief history of time which you know very popular book you should probably read it if you're interested in that kind of stuff um but he was talking about particles that look differently but are actually the same thing. And at higher energies, they all kind of just go into one form. Mm. And the way you think of it is at a roulette table, when you give the ball a lot of energy, mm. it's free to just rotate around. But once it loses kinetic energy, it falls into wow. a, specific, a specific category. And so that's why at these like low energy levels, we see different types of particles. But once you raise the energy of the system, everything looks the same. And so it's kind of the same when we talk about the unification of forces, mm. where when we go back in time, we look at the early universe when uh, we think that all of the forces were connected into one and then they branched off eventually. Mm. In the early universe, everything was really hot. There was a lot of energy condensed into a relatively small uh, area relative to today. And so, in these high energy situations, this is where, you know, you, you get raised out of these boxes and you're free to kind of, mm. everything looks the same. So all of these forces that describe interactions between particles and even, you know, massless particles, it's, it's all governed by the same thing. I love how you brought it back to cosmology, like for no reason. Cosmology is did. great. <laughs> like I'm just smiling the whole time. I'm like, well, like, I guess, yeah, no, it, there was a time when I guess a lot of this was irrelevant no longer is the case yeah well once now that we're living trying to describe things you're saying like gravity is the consequence of right. something and then you have electromagnetism which is actually like a description of interacting right. charges it's like eventually maybe like gravity is also just the same like a different aspect of the same principle right that, I mean, that's the goal. That's the goal. One, one theory describing everything is the goal. So, Well, yeah. yeah. So while that is quite out of reach uh, currently, let's just try yeah. to think a little bit more sure. about just the structure of a magnet. Now, like the first or at least magnet, I believe, was called ferromagnet because 
I believe like the first thing that was found to be magnetic was like the iron in, I believe it was like a pretty funny story where these individuals were like walking with uh, slippers like made from metal or some sort that actually attracted to the ground. That, slippers that made of metal? No, I don't know about metal, but basically the story that I've heard that, that they were walking on magnetite, I believe, and they're, um, they basically attracted to the ground and they're like, oh, wow. Was it called magnet. magnetite before we knew what magnets were? I don't think so. Because that would be no, pretty I don't coincidental. So. I, don't, I don't think so. Okay. I think it was called that after because it's actually a paramagnet. It's not actually a ferromagnet. Okay. So it's not like a permanent magnet. But I believe there was some kind of story like that. But anyways, the idea behind a simple magnet is the direction of these of these charged particles or of, I guess, of particles in an object. So usually for a neutral object, for this table, for example, we can kind of say that this table is electrically neutral. Mm -hmm. And I guess, I guess electrically, yeah, okay. I guess, I guess we can say neutral in that sense as well. But the reason that this table is not currently producing a magnetic field is because half of these, half of these particles, or like if I look at any cross section of this table, all of the particles are kind of arranged opposite to each other. So one has like spin up, one has spin down. Basically, I'm talking about electron spin. So like the spins of these particles are all opposite. So when you have a bunch of particles in a row with all, you know, one up, one down, one up, one down, they basically tend to cancel any influence that they have with each other. Now, here is what a magnetic substance does. A ferromagnetic substance, or most commonly like iron, for example, or anything, a ferromagnetic substance is like a permanent magnet. And that has the property of aligning its spins in either direction. So sometimes if, let's say, you bring up another magnet to... Now, this, these are actually called paramagnets, that they, they get induced a magnetic field only temporarily when you bring it in an external magnetic field. So if you bring in an external magnetic field, you're kind of temporarily aligning the particles close to the north side or whatever towards it. And the ones farther from the north side or whatever side you brought closer to the magnet away from it. So it kind of creates a temporary field. So again, the field is simply being generated from the fact that there is a lot of concentration of upspin on, let's say, one side of, or one part of the object. And there's a concentration of downspin on the other side of the object. And the interesting nature of this, of reality and why we haven't actually found any magnetic monopoles or anything like that yet is because they're very, very unlikely because things like to, like, things like to be neutral. So an object will want to have an equal number of up and down spins. Now, where they're arranged basically tells you the magnetic property of the, of, of, of the, of the material. Does that have to do with entropy? Because I guess if all of the spins are aligned right. in a material, that's like low entropy. Right. Right. And as soon as like I think it I starts would, to randomize, like the entropy be, increases. Yeah. I think you're right like because that. here's why you're right, actually. Because, wait, entropy increases with temperature, right? So lowest yes. is lowest. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So now a perfect magnet. Now, this is not called zero degree Kelvin, exactly, right? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Zero degree Kelvin, because you want these atoms to basically be not moving, but perfectly, but perfectly aligned with each other. And that's and that's the goal of a magnet or, or a magnetic material. The more you heat it up or as, as, as soon as they get over zero degrees or zero Kelvin, they start moving and it the fields just get shifted just a little bit. So they're not as strong. Which is why like superconductors and whatnot that have those very, very strong magnetic fields like on the, on the maglev train. We should talk about the maglev trains. Oh, anyways. But like, uh, like things that, like the magnets on the maglev trains, for example, all of those are kept in super chilled environments because that's the best way to strengthen a magnet. So again, basically what's a magnet? It's just when their atoms are aligned in an object. And I find that that's basically what explains a lot of the magic. So I think that that's a... Nice little description of a, yeah. a common easy magnet. So that's like magnets or magnetism in materials. But earlier in, I guess, last year or something like that, uh, we talked about static charges that produce electric fields. And 
what happens when you start looking at charges that move around, you see that it produces a magnetic field. Uh, so the actual like formula, I guess, is um, it's the velocity of the particle and then cross product, or I guess, sorry, the force of this magnetic field or the force that it produces on a charge is equal, or is, I guess is proportional to the charge, the test charge, mm. and then times the velocity cross the B field. And as soon as you see a cross product, what you should think of is like 90 degrees, okay? Because uh, a cross product has the um, property that if you were to like expand it, it would be the magnitude of the first thing times the magnitude of the second thing and then sine of the angle that um, comes between these two vectors. Um, so if you're if your charge is moving in the same direction as the magnetic field, there's actually no force being put onto that test charge. Um, however, if your charge is going exactly perpendicular to the B field, then you're getting the full effect, the mm. full acceleration due to the magnetic field. Or sorry, I know I've been saying B field. B field is the same as magnetic oh, field, yeah. by the way. I, <laughs> I guess that might be a little bit confusing. Now, but why all of this happens is pretty interesting though. Cause like the cross product, is has, has always been like an interesting thing to me because in this case also remember one thing that you missed out with a cross product is the fact that number one it's a vector that points normal to both the original that, that both the vectors mm -hmm. being crossed together so in this case velocity cross the magnetic field the force will therefore be perpendicular to both the velocity and the yeah. magnetic field yeah and that's simply a property of these cross products and i think that with the magnetic field, I mean, I guess, I guess you can think of this as the magnetic force, but it's a very general formula, actually, that it's basically the, the, the elect or the, the total force can be described by the total charge or the test charge, the size of the test charge multiplied by the force per unit charge. Now, the force per unit charge is what can be varied. The force per unit charge can be an electric field. It can be a purely magnetic field. It can be a mix of an electromagnetic field, hence the name. So there are multiple things that can act on this force. And it basically is what kind of creates some interesting motion. I think we're going to talk about some interesting motion that this force can create. Yeah, one thing that is also pretty interesting to note is that magnetic fields do no work. Right. And this right. comes f like very naturally out of the cross product here. Um, so work is essentially you're integrating over the path of a particle uh, and you're integrating the dot product between the force and a little differential mm. um, oh. distance right. that you're traveling. Right. Uh, the dot product will tell you that if you're moving perpendicularly to the force, then you're getting zero contribution to the work. And we as called the dot product is cosine, which is yeah, why that happens, yeah. right? And if you remember the the force due to the um, the magnetic field is the velocity cross the B field, mm. which means that you're always moving perpendicular <laughs> to the force that is being applied. And if you integrate throughout your path, you're just adding up a bunch of zeros. Right. So if you're in, if, there, if you have a particle in an electromagnetic field, the only thing that can ever do work on your particle is the electric field. Yeah, that's an interesting consequence, right? And this force that happens to be a subject of this magnetic field, of a purely magnetic field, happens to be a famous name called the Lorenz force. And this, I think we have most definitely said this name before when we were talking about maybe on, on some topics of particle accelerators. Because mm -hmm. particle accelerators are basically anything where you want a particle well, to accelerate, you usually use the Lorenz force, or at least the mm -hmm. understanding from the Lorenz force, right? So basically, all that it's really telling you is the direction of where your magnetic field would need to be to realize some sort of force. So let me let me just lay it out here. So a particle accelerator 
Now, typically, if you want to accelerate particles to very high velocities, why? You want to get them to very high energies. And, if, and to get it to very high energies, you basically want to you know, make them travel because, again, you need to keep increasing their speed. You need to keep accelerating them. That means they need to be traveling for a really long time before they get to the enough energy such that they can you know, collide or whatever. So how do we accelerate this without basically building something as large as the circumference of the earth, right? Hence the particle accelerator. It's a simple circular setup that uses the, or, or that sets up the force, the magnetic force in such a way where it acts as the centripetal force. So recall in, a, in circular motion, the centripetal force acts towards the center of said motion. So if let's say, Wait, I'm just I'm just thinking about I'm just thinking about the fields here. So if let's say you wanted uh, looking top down onto a particle accelerator, if let's say you were sending your particle straight again, I hope the listeners can follow here. So you're sending a particle straight. You would want if 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 you want your particle to travel in a in a circular pattern. And uh, right now I'm, I'm, I'm pointing counterclockwise here. So if you want your particle to travel in a counterclockwise direction, you need to impose a magnetic field that, okay, how do I explain this? Part it goes upwards. downward, no, downwards, V cross B, uh, downwards, downwards, right? right? So you want a magnetic field that points downwards into the particle accelerator. So mm. again, if you're looking from top view, you want the magnetic field to point down if your particle is wanting to go counterclockwise. Mm. So in that situation, and again, I'm going to, I'm, I think we're going to talk about the right hand rule in a second, which is like one of the most crucial things in this whole setup is your force acts towards the center, regardless of where your particle is. And that's simply the setup of this experiment. So hypothetically, you can basically keep accelerating your particle until it has because again it's just in circles right so you can just keep accelerating but accelerating. You, you can't you can't accelerate it using the magnetic field right because it, it doesn't do any work on it that's I, what i was I, thinking no no, no. Yeah. I, I remember this i remember this and i remember it being answered in griffiths because this was like the whole mm. I, I remember this being answered in griffiths like how mm. do you accelerate it in a particle accelerator mm. because yes you're right the magnetic field does no work but i believe via changing the magnetic field you are, hmm, I'm not entirely sure, but I think it's something to do with the fact that an induced electric field, like on the charged particle, because remember all these particles are charged, like these, the electric field from the charged particle might be the one doing the work. I could be, I mm. could be, mistaken, See the, but obviously yeah, it's being also, accelerated in the also, process another example okay. where like you know those giant magnets that lift up cars yeah yeah it's like if you lift up a car with a magnet yeah then what's doing the work right <laughs> if the magnetic field is what's a attracting the right. car and you're moving it up in space then what's doing the work it says it says uh they answered in chapter eight <laughs> so the, no, I the, remember, this no, has I not this. this has not yet to do with where we are at in terms of like talking about the lorentz force and we're gonna get to current um, but yeah, hopefully by the end of uh, this episode, we'll, we'll touch on that again. But yeah, we, yeah. Wait, this is a very interesting thing because one second, no, I remember reading that this in Griffiths, where they very explicitly said the like this this whole thing that oh, it doesn't have like m like magnetic forces can't do work. Oh wait, wait, I think I remember. Magnetic? No, wait. I remember my teacher made a pretty a big uh, distinction between magnetic fields and forces. But I'm thinking like, why? Like, they're, aren't they like very similar? Because I remember him saying like magnetic forces do no work, but magnetic fields, which induce electric fields, do mm. the work or something like that. You know, I'm not entirely mm. sure. That's interesting. Because in that car example, I'm thinking exactly about that. Like, what do you think is actually doing the work? Because I don't know. Is it like... I forget. Is it like, is it an electromagnet that's picking it up? It has to be. Because then that might be, that might be creating an electric field because I'm a... I mean, the thing is that the, what else is the force the may not do any work, but the field itself carries energy, right? Like there's, right, a, there's right. an energy I mean, density. Energy, right, so it right. might be something to do with that. Like it stores, like the energy that is stored in the field itself gets turned mm -hmm. into work or I don't know. I'm not sure. 
But anyways, mm, I think... Yeah, no, that's a little interesting. I think we should move on to magnetostatics. Yes. Which is your first introduction to calculating stuff with magnetic fields. And it's right. obviously the, the easiest path of entry. Mm-hmm. When I say magnetostatics, it is actually very not static. Mm. Um, it's charges moving, of course. We talked about that. Uh, in order to get a magnetic field, you need uh, moving charges. The thing that is actually static is... Well, should be said as stable, magnetostable, I guess. I mean, um, where let's say you have a line of charges and those charges are moving. Um, it's just kind of like constant, right? It's just infinite charges moving in a single direction. And then you ask, like, what is the magnetic field around that? Um, well, the static comes from the fact that, well, the, mag- the magnetic field is static. Oh yeah, I guess straight up by the, definition, the magnetic think, like, field is static, yeah. but we don't know that yet, right? We're, we're 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 gonna get to that by oh, ca- well, by calculating. Technically, right now we don't know that it's yeah. static, but yeah. a, a learning that we happen yeah. to see is that there is no dependence. Okay, I don't know if we've actually got there yet, but yeah, the magnetic field doesn't have any dependence. I'm, I'm just I'm just thinking about the whole formula sheet in my head right now, mm. and the magnetic field has no dependence on. What am I thinking of here? Like the only thing that would vary it is the current. Yes, exactly. This is what I was thinking of. So in Mm -hmm. this case, the only thing that's varying the magnetic field is the current through said loop. And we're going to get into this in a second. And the Mm -hmm. current is like your one of the most important things in determining this magnetic field. So it's all about is your current static. So so in this case, your current being static means it's a constant number. Yeah. Well, technically current density, right? Because the current can stay the same but like the actual shape can change and that would affect it as well. I think yeah, I mean, in the limit mean? or something. Like, I'm just talking about, what do you mean? No, I mean, like, about- I mean, if you have a current, like let's say you have a loop yeah. and then you have a wire going through the loop, yeah. you're, you have some sort of current right. going through that loop. Right. Um, but if your wire gets thicker, but so you have less current density. I mean, the but- current doesn't just, I mean, the current doesn't just form on the loop. It'll only form if it, if EMF, like if, if you flux the magnet. No, I'm not talking about the loop. I'm just talking about like current per second, right? Like mm. or, ch- or charges per second. Right. How you, how you can... Like you're talking about like the lambda. The, how, like the, yeah, so how the, the shape of your actual... Charge density. The shape of your current can change or like the volume <laughs> of your thing can change. But you still get the same current. And but current I think density. I think that the shape definitely changes the, the field lines, right? So your your magnetic field can change while you still have the same current, like magnitude of current. Yeah. So because I guess I guess you can I guess it's safe to say in a in a varying current field or like a magnetic field, the 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 density, charge density, current density mm. is not constant, right? Yeah. I think the point so I of... Guess, I guess maybe you're right. I think that's what's constant. I, th- I think the point of all this is to say that symmetry is your best friend. Right. Um, yeah, so current is charge density times velocity. Hmm. Charge density is charge, and if we're... We'll start with one dimensional, right? So it's charge per centimeter, charge per length, meter. Unit length. Charge per length. And then velocity is length per second. And so actually your current has units of charge per second. How much, I was going to say electricity, but that's kind mm-hmm. of not right. But how much charge is passing by per second? That is the current. Mm-hmm. And uh, from the current, you can actually extrapolate or actually, <laughs> you, you can calculate the magnitude of the force. So before we were talking about, okay, you have uh, a magnetic field and then you have a charge that's in that magnetic field. What is the force? And obviously you need that charge to be moving for there to be a force. Um, when you're dealing with like, let's say wires that mm-hmm. have charges moving through them, all of a sudden... Um, you know, this is very classic in physics where you start with a single particle and then you say, well, what happens if I have many particles? Then I just add up the contribution to all of the particles and then I get a big thing. Like, Mm. for example, mass. If I want to say the mass, the total mass of something, I just add up all of the little particles that I have. And then what happens if instead of having a bunch of particles, you have a continuous solid while you just 
integrate. Okay, that now remember nice though. Nice keyword. Continuous charges are not real. Right. Like remember it's a that. it's a really nice approximation. Yeah. Though, very useful in your calculations. Obviously, no charge can ever be like truly continuous. Also, also now here is something super distinctive, um, in this whole in this whole regime, regime, um. And that's like drift velocity or like velocity of these charges. Like what velocity are we actually talking mm. about when talking about the velocity of this thing? So usually we are, we would think that it is the velocity of whatever information is being traveled or, or, or whatever information is being sent. For example, like if, um, let's say I have a wire connecting circuit A to circuit B and circuit A does something such that the current travels to circuit B. If I want to find the time that it takes for the information to travel, I should be like, okay, when did it leave circuit A? When did it get to circuit B? That's the time it took to travel. And what you will find out is that that velocity is pretty comparable to the speed of light. Pretty comparable. And when you include relativistic charges, like when these velocities are relativistic, a lot of these formulae that we're going to be talking about all kind of break or not break down, but have to be amended. They all have to be, something has to be changed. Something has to be added. Maybe the, the Lorenz factor or something like that has to be transformed such that it takes into consideration the relativistic charges. So therefore we're actually not talking about the speed of information that was processed or transferred. We're actually talking about the speed of the electrons. Now you must be like, wait, aren't they the same? No, they're not. Because electrons actually move very, very slow, like mm -hmm. a few inches per. No, not even. I think it's even slower. Like a few. Did you do that example with the wire that goes across the ocean? I read. Oh, whoa, no. Or something. It no, was like it was cool. like a very long wire, yeah. and they like you calculate the actual speed of the. Ele oh, I think I, I I think the reason why you didn't do it is because this was a problem site question for me. Oh, um, okay. Basically, the question was: you have a really long wire. And they give you properties about the wire, yeah. like uh, the, the matter density. Mm. They say assume one electron per mm. thing. And then uh, they ask you to actually calculate the speed of the electrons. And then they're like, oh, this should be like much less than the mm. speed of light. Right. Like what's right. what's right. actually happening here? Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what, and so then, what you were saying. And uh, yeah, so that's basically the major difference between a pulse traveled in a in a cable and the electrons traveling in a cable because again the way electro like the way cables work is if one electron tra like carry the information that would be very very inefficient so it's kind of like a it's kind of like a queue of electrons you can think stashed up in a wire and every time one gets in one gets out one gets in one gets out so if you actually think about it Almost instantaneously, the moment you put the electron in... Not instantaneously, though. Okay, obviously not. <laughs> but I'm saying almost, like very fast, the moment you put or you want to transfer the information, it's basically already transferred. But again, that is not the velocity that we're talking about when talking about this, like this, uh, this magnetic... Or sorry, this current. This current has to do with the drift velocity, which is that velocity of the electron... Wait... The drift is the electron actual velocity, right? Yeah. Mm. And that's what it actually has to deal with, which is significantly slower. Just an important note. Mm -hmm. Also, do you want to talk about the right-hand rule? Because I think we should. We can. Just really quickly. So yeah. the right-hand rule is a very fundamental rule in, well, in all of physics, actually. Uh, but it is very applicable when we talk about magnets. Because there's it, a lot of cross products. Yes, in there. exactly. So it has everything to do with the cross product. So it basically tells you if you have two vectors that you want to find the cross product of, what will be the direction of the resulting vector? So if you have the velocity vector cross the magnetic vector or the magnetic field vector, what will be the, for the, the direction of the force, right? And yeah, so that's given by the right-hand rule, which is how do we, how do we best describe this? So. It, it, you take your right point. hand, okay, just put just put your thumb it. in the direction of the first vector, and then not your thumb. Your, oh no no, no, no. it is your well your thumb. no the, the, I'm just gonna do the better version of it. Like you put your thumb in the first vector, and then your your fingers curl in the direction of. Uh, yeah, but that's if you oh. already know the direction of the vector that you want to find out. I'm saying, let's say you have v cross b. You have v. You have b. You have those directions. You want to find the direction of force. Where are you going to point your thumb? 
Yeah, but there, there, there's two versions, but there's an easier version, right? Well, like, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, I, I'm just saying in this case, like the easy way to think about it is put or there, I mean, yeah, there are multiple ways to think about it. The curling way is really nice in magnetic fields yeah. because magnetic fields curl. And I want to talk about this in a second, but like the, the curling is very nice in this particular case. So what are we talking about basically? So pointing your hand, your right hand, hence the name in the direction of the first vector. So if it's velocity cross magnetic field, so pointing oh, your yeah, hand was, in the I direction. Said, I said it wrong. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm saying. I'm like, yeah. what are you saying? In the, in the direction of the first vector, you curl. <laughs> I don't know if that's a very, <laughs> you curl your fingers to yeah. the direction of the other. Now. Yeah. You have to remember that you cannot physically curl your hand the other way yeah, unless you have that's not allowed. a bone problem. No, I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> that's not allowed, right? So you have to curl inside. So whatever side, so you again, put your hand towards the first vector, curl towards the second vector, wherever your thumb is pointing is the direction of the resultant vector. And the reason the curl works very nicely is because in magnetic fields, well, they curl. So interestingly enough, there are two very important properties of electro and magnetic fields that happen to kind of work out together very well. And that is that the curl of the electric field is equal to the divergence of the magnetic field. That's both zero. <laughs> okay, let's Which not let's it. not do that. No, should I not explain this? Is this not no, important? No, no, because we can then, then no? we're going to have to talk about like the implications of curl and divergence talk, in, in every single case. I just want to talk about the curling. You don't want to talk about... I mean, we don't have to go into that much depth. That's going to be pretty crazy. Yeah? If you, I mean, if you want to. Just, just briefly, just briefly, I wanted to talk about the paddle wheel example. Just the difference between what an electric field is doing and a magnetic field. Because, see, this is the problem that not a lot of things are taught. Like, you can understand, okay, this is the formula for the electric field, but what is it doing? You know, like that's what you really want to understand. And this is, I think, a very nice way to understand what is the actual difference between what the electric field and the magnetic field are doing. Because they're actually doing two completely different things, which is how they can exist together. They are actually perpendicular to one another, which is yeah, how they all exist times, together. Yeah, at which all is really time, cool. Which is exactly how they work together. So a fundamental rule, which is what I just said, the divergence thing and the curl thing. So I think we have spoken about divergence and curl before. Yeah. So I don't think we have to go through that again. Not really. Right? But Divergence basically tells you what it like. It's going outwards, I guess. It's diverging, and then curl is like, like spinning a around or, a point. Kind right. Of so like if it's this. like a source or like a sink, like if like if something is going outwards or coming inwards, so like if there's a more coming out than in or more in than out, then yeah. it's divergence. But if that's not true, then it's curl. And in the curling case, the, <laughs> that's I, the such other, a bad explanation. No, the best way to think about it, I think, is a paddle wheel example. Yeah. If you think, um, again, top down view, you put a paddle wheel. Is a paddle wheel a I common guess. object? Yeah, yeah, sure. I guess. A paddle wheel, like a. Yeah, like a windmill or type. If you have a small like, windmill. Like a windmill you know? type deal. Like, yeah, like one that water. is kind of. Like, again, it's on the. It's all coplanar, right? So it's all on the same plane. And. Wait, yeah. is this? So if you, yeah, if, yeah, if the nice water, if yeah. the water is your, like the flow of the water is your field right. and you're asking, you know, does my field have curl at this point where right. I, wherever I put the paddle wheel, right. well, the paddle wheel would actually be spinning in a certain direction. So it's curling. Exactly. But if the, if your field has no curl, then the paddle wheel would actually be stationary. So if you think about it in a divert, in a purely divergent field, it would not be curling because all of the paddle or, or, or all of the wheels are not being affected by any uh, or by any purpose. Like all, all of the travel is parallel to the to the wheels. Mm. But in the curling case, it's perpendicular to the wheels. Yeah. So I think you can already understand why and how the electric and magnetic fields are perpendicular. Because by this literal definition, one is curling. So one is pushing the paddle and one is parallel to the paddle. So like by definition, they are perpendicular yeah. to each other. And, and I think that's a really nice. So one thing connection. that's, that's really nice about like, we're not going to talk about Maxwell, Maxwell's like correction terms and all that. Um, but before all of, all of that stuff, it was very nice because you had expressions f in terms of electric field and magnetic field that were very nicely symmetric right. where the curl of the electric field is zero. You can imagine just, uh, like an electron in space how the electric field just always points out radially from the uh, electron. So there, there's nothing really rotating or mm -hmm. whatever. That's, you know, 
it's a bad explanation, but you know what I mean. Um, the electric field has zero curl, and on top of that, the divergence of the electric field is proportional mm. to the charge distribution. That makes sense. Right? Um, on the other hand, the divergence of a magnetic field is zero. Patent pending, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's not really, <laughs> yeah, joke. That's not really But right. anyways, yeah. classically, right, if you, if you have a steady current, the divergence is zero, and... Uh, the curl is actually proportional mm. to the current density itself. Now, note that all of this is with static. The yeah. moment we go into yeah. moving, like yeah. time varying fields, yeah. this is no longer true. Mm -hmm. The curl of the electric field is non zero, and neither is the divergence of the magnetic, because in this case, we have these things varying with time. So at one moment in time, it could be more at one, like, for example, that could be more of a field inside than outside. And that's what causes a net divergence or something like that. Right. So it can always be a little bit finicky the moment we have these charges that are now not only in motion, but well, what's the, yeah, I mean, the charges are always in motion, but mm -hmm. varying motion, like accelerating, for example, sure. are not only constant. Velocity. If you, if you've taken vector calculus, then you're probably um, lighting up right now that we talk about divergence and curl because the most like beautiful things ever about uh, vector calculus is Stokes theorem and divergence theorem, mm. which literally you cannot like, you cannot Green's not theorem, do right. uh, electromagnetism without those two theorems. It's basically from the very beginning you're using right. those two. Um, as soon as we talk about the curl of something, you might uh, recognize the fact that, okay, if we integrate the curl of this, over a surface, we can translate that to a line integral over the boundary. Mm. And uh, if you just take what we just said, like the curl of the B field is proportional to the current density, integrate both sides over a uh, surface, use Stokes theorem, all of a sudden you get something very cool known as Ampere's law, which is that if you have a loop, just imagine a loop and you integrate the B field, over that loop just a nice little line integral turns out that that is actually equal to mu naught which is just a constant and then times the enclosed current which is the current going through mm. a surface that is enclosed by the loop mm -hmm. so if you have a wire and you draw a loop around that wire by symmetry there's a lot of symmetry arguments in uh, in electromagnetism by symmetry, the B field is the s has the same magnitude at a given uh, radius from right. the wire, right? A, a, a radius vector pointing a perpendicular. I mean, simply if you calculate the magnetic field right. by this law, you'll get that it only depends on your radius, yeah, right? Sure. Exactly. So, so by exactly. drawing what is known as an Amperian loop, which is very analogous to a Gaussian surface. Mm -hmm. Oh, which is so beautiful because when we talk about Electro uh, electrostatics, we used divergence and we used surfaces. Right, right. So I was actually just going to bring exactly. this point up right after. Because we had the divergence and so we yeah. said, okay, let's take a volume integral yeah. and convert it to a surface integral using right. uh, the divergence theorem. Now we're, we're now we're doing... Isn't it called the divergence theorem? Green's theorem, technically. I mean, well, it's divergence the same name. theorem. Yeah, no, but I just like green because I'm like, give the man some credit. I sure, guess, You know, divergence, sure. like, who, who are you yeah. giving credit to? Yeah. So yeah. Green's theorem. Um, yeah. You're using divergence and you're using Green's theorem. As soon as you get into magnetostatics, it's, it's like it's the other side of the coin. Right. And it's the same thing because you, you, you're sorry. taking electric fields and the other side of the coin to that is magnetic fields. That You have Green's theorem. The other side of the coin is Stokes' theorem. So you're, now you have the curl of the B field mm. converting that into line integral. And then you get some really cool stuff about enclosed currents versus enclosed charges, which mm. was what we did. And again, the fundamental difference here, again, is all about the directions that they point. The reason you use Gaussian with electric is because it diverges outwards. So remember, in all of these for in all of these theorems, it is some field dotted with the differential in some direction, right? So again, dot product, if it's perpendicular, there's a problem. 
So that is literally why you can't apply the same surface idea on a magnetic field because it'll simply curl along with the surface. But right. actually, so it'll, it, be, it'll it, be perpendicular it to the area element. It wouldn't matter though because uh, we already know the divergence is zero. So there's no point in applying. Well, no, the I'm Green's saying this is kind of showing you that that is even more true. Because then you'd like just be apply. you'd be summing over zero. No, so but that that, like, that that that's exactly what I'm showing. The fact that yeah. that holds true kind of also impl like kind of tells us mm -hmm. why. For example, why do you need a loop? in magnetostatics and why do you need a surface in electrostatics well it's simply because of these directions yeah. if you think about a loop the dl vector is inherently perpendicular to the da vector the area element of a surface if you take a surface and a loop so like if you put a loop around a surface and you draw the differential in the length and the differential in the area you they will inherently be perpendicular and that's how you can also kind yeah. of get even more insight into the perpendicularity I don't know that's the word of the magnetic and electric field. Here's another cool analogy. Cool, yeah. Here's another cool analogy drawn between uh, electrostatics and magnetostatics. This was my favorite part of the course, by the way, seeing like going from electrostatics yeah, to magnetostatics yeah, yeah. and seeing everything that was just mirrored on the, the other the side. Formulae are similar. Yeah, the applications so similar. are similar. Yeah. And especially like when you get to electrodynamics, which is also, by the way, sorry, I know you're going to say something, but I just want to say one very important thing. Griffiths. Yeah. For anybody who wants to get into electromagnet, uh, yeah, I I into electromagnetism, I mean the second and third year courses are both covered by what is it called? Introduction to Electrodynamics by Griffiths. Yeah. What, what's his first name? Edward. No, no, that's Edwards. That's different. What, who, okay. Griffiths is like m probably I think you were telling me the other day, right? One of the most popular. Yeah textbooks used worldwide I think, I think everybody uses because Griffiths. of the exactly because of so how good. good the textbook is like i don't think you get a better textbook than this no you can't it flows he's talking to you during the textbook you know like you're actually enjoying the read and the examples flow with each other it's not like oh look at an example five chapters ago like it's all working together and it's just a beautiful read so yeah so i just wanted to mention if you do want to basically learn everything we're talking about just go ahead and check out griffiths because like it has a to b of electrodynamics a to, a to, or z. A to z sorry what was it? a to z, z. All right. what a guy so what i was gonna say is that right. sorry sorry Continue. when you when you have let's say a a sphere or just the outside where's that a sphere yeah you have a sphere of charges Using Gauss's law, you can say shell, that a shell. You, you have a shell of charges. In, inside that shell, your electric field is zero. Right. Why? Because you can draw like any surface inside. And you can say, I'm enclosing zero right. charge, which means that integrating all throughout that surface, I will be integrating uh, essentially zero at all points. Yeah, the, the, in, the enclosed charge argument is kind of important too. Because like initially when I originally understood it, like enclosed charge, I'm like, why doesn't a charge kept outside like affect it at all? Yeah, yeah. And it's very interesting because any charge that kept outside, remember these field lines need to return. They need to terminate somewhere. So all of their contribution, any charge outside, it will it will provide a contribution to said surface and then it'll take that contribution right away because it needs to terminate back on the charge. And that's simply the understanding behind enclosed surfaces. So in all of electrodynamics, we deal with uh, enclosed charges and enclosed currents. And why are they enclosed? Simply because anything or any charge kept outside said surface must, by the theory of what makes these fields, terminate at their own point. So they cannot terminate within the surface. The only way that you have some current within the surface is if it terminates within the surface, right? So it starts and ends within the surface. So all of that is closed, right? Enclosed. I don't know you what that? you mean by terminate in terms of charges. So, okay, like so a charge just goes like, outwards. I'm just talking about like an electric field. It doesn't, if, you, if you think about like an electric though. field though, like oh, I'm talking, about, talking like about a dipole. Well, I'm just talking about a general. Because if you have a charge, right. the electric field just goes out. That's it. It doesn't come back. It's a, it's a charge. Right. Right. Coulomb's law, like it just goes out. Oh, Whatever sorry. I... I'm, I'm, yeah. So that, so my explanation actually applies to magnetic, the magnetic dipole understanding because you need a terminating north and south pole next to it. But for elect, 
but for but for electric charges, actually, the I think because I'm actually thinking about it now. I've always thought about this because the whole idea behind the enclosed charge is because on one side you will like the idea is that the net charge enclosed, even if you bring a charge to the outside. The reason it doesn't affect it is because there's equal charge coming in and equal going out. Mm -hmm. But now that I'm really well, thinking about line, it. It's line, right? Like it's not charged. Yeah, but now that I'm really thinking about it, like tell me I'm wrong here or like explain it to me where if I bring something really close to the side of like a charger, uh, like, a, like a conductor, why, like won't the field lines be stronger at one side than the other? So would there not be a... A part that this, well, it's all about. I think, no, there's a reason. The, I know the thing is, it, it, it's all about symmetry, right? Because when you do the surface integral, you're setting up the surface in a way such that you can take out the the absolute value of the electric field. Right, right, right? Always, always. But if you have a surface and a, just one charge next to it, all of a sudden your integral becomes pretty difficult, and you actually don't get. I don't think you get zero because. The electric field at a certain point like the actually no what i'm saying it is true what i'm saying is true but it's true in a complicated way because the argument that you're trying to make when you say the electric field at a certain point the reason you're saying at a point is because you make it radially symmetric around that charge and so it doesn't matter which way you're looking yeah. you're talking about a distance from that charge yeah no i'm just trying to understand but, why this but, charge doesn't influence okay. it does though but here's why here's why it comes out to zero but like if you have a charge outside of a surface that surface like you can't use gauss's law well you like you you can and it does work but it won't tell you anything about the electric field at a certain point the reason is because that charge will be sending right when you do a surface integral, you're doing the the vector at a point on that surface dotted with dA. Right. Right. And so one half of the surface will be um, like divergence going in. Mm. So flux going into the surface and the other half will be flux coming out of the surface. Yeah, but wouldn't... So integrating right. over that entire surface will cancel out. But it doesn't tell you about the electric field at a given point because at one point it'll be going in the surface. At another point, yeah, it'll no, be going no, out the surface. Yeah, I get that. I get so that. So actually, yeah. when you do the integral, right. it comes out to zero because, well, one argument is that it's not enclosing anything. And another yeah. another argument is that it's it's if you take a sphere, it's symmetric, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. whatever comes in, comes out. It's all about, it's all about enclosing and symmetries. Yeah. That's why, I mean, for anyone taking electrodynamics, um, always, yeah, symmetries is like the number one place where yeah. you can get booted because yeah. I feel like knowing when to use which formula is more important than knowing the formulas itself. I mean, I think that actually applies in most cases, but I think even more in this case because here you always want to remember that most of these formulas, I think all of them have a dot product in them with the, again, with some differential. Or cross products, length. right? Like Bio Savard. Yeah, I guess, I guess. Products. So you always want to remember that, okay, in cases of dot products, I want them to be parallel. In cases of cross products, I want them to be perpendicular. And if that's true, I can easily take it out of the integral because again, then it doesn't really, because again, the cross product, if V and B, for example, are perpendicular to each other, the cross product of them will simply be it's just B, B. the product. Exactly, right? just the product. The magnitude. The, the magnitude, exactly. And you, and you can infer the direction later. That's what happens a lot in problems what you'll do is you'll say, due to the geometry of the problem, yeah. I can say that the magnetic field always points perpendicularly to the radius vector from, let's yeah. say, a, a cylinder. So I'm going to put that to the side and just deal with the magnitude. Mm. And then after your final answer, you just say the magnitude and then you throw a phi hat on the end, mm. indicating the direction. But what I was going to say yeah. about Gauss's law and Ampere's law is that let's take a let's take a coil. You have just an infinite coil of wire that goes up. Solenoid. It's called a solenoid, but you know. Yeah, no, it's I mean it's a very important object in yeah, no, it, like in uh, it is, but in electrical. I'm anything. just I'm just saying you have a boom. 
long solenoid. solenoid. Again, also, sorry, sorry, I keep cutting you off, but like w- whenever long is set in, especially in these scenarios, it's inferred to be infinite yeah. because that's just like a much easier approximation. The moment you don't have infinite things, you have all oh, various contributions from various different lengths mm-hmm. and whatnot. So it starts to get complicated, but you can assume most of these things are this way. All right. So, so now you draw your Empyrean loop inside of this coil. So you just draw like a little rectangular loop on the inside. Now on the inside, there's actually no current going through that loop because the current is going round and round on the outside. And so you just figured something out that's pretty incredible is that there is no magnetic field inside of a no, 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 no. coil of wire. Is that not true? No, there is a magnetic field because the only Wait, contribution outside. is coming from the inside. The outside is zero because oh right, 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 right. The way yeah, that yeah. it's set up is very yeah. interesting because of the direction. Now, usually when we have like an infinite cylinder, which is like kind of like a solenoid, we would think the current. Oh travels. right, I did it the opposite yeah, way. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like we would think the current travels along the solenoid. Hence, we can apply everything that you said, but. In a solenoid, that's not necessarily the case because the current is actually looping around the cylinder. I should have started with, you draw a loop outside of the solenoid. Right, (laughs) right. There you have zero current, so zero uh, magnetic field. There's also a a more subtle argument that has to do with the two sides of the rectangle where you can draw one close and one far and the contributions have to cancel each other. It's actually not zero. It's simply, so it's actually... Oh, it is the, zero. No, no, but there's a reason that's zero. It's not It's not zero because there's zero enclosed current. It's actually over here, if, if, if you yeah, read the reason... Because it has them, to cancel. Exactly. No, the thing and is... And for arbitrary distance, for arbitrary length, right? So the way that it's set up is that it must be zero at infinity. That's like the magnetic field of this thing. That's, that's, that's one thing. As far away, it must be zero. Using the Empyrean loop outside of a solenoid you simply get that the magnetic field must be equal on both corners of said loop. And because right. it goes to zero at infinity, it must be zero everywhere. Sure. That's, that's your kind of, that's, that's your understanding. Right. So, and I mean, very, very similar, but like that understanding mm. is crucial because mm. it doesn't necessarily have to be zero because it's not actually zero enclosed, right? They bring out a thing. That's when you do the second step. That's the second step. Oh, right. That's the second right. step. That's so what, I was, what I was saying is that the first step is you draw right. you draw your loop outside and you say that the magnetic field, when you integrate up one side, has to cancel with the other side. Right. But this is true for any length loop and any distance away, so, which means since uh, it's ar- like this has to be ar- true for arbitrary distance, then it's like you have like one thing equal to multiple things, multiple different things. It mm-hmm. has to be zero. Mm-hmm. So now when you draw your second loop, this is like part two of calculating the magnetic field you draw it half inside the coil half outside the coil now since you already figured out that it's zero inside the coil then all that's left to do is just you carry out the integral for the other half of the of the loop and then you get the magnetic field obviously we're not gonna we're not Mm. gonna talk about (laughs) yeah actually that that was a simple like how do we use uh ampere's law it's very very similar to gaussian in the case of you're basically wanting to enclose some charge i mean sorry enclose some current and then you want to compute them you want to compute the field again you always want symmetry arguments so you want these things per uh you want you want these things parallel to each other right you want these things parallel to each other so that's basically the idea behind a lot of this motivation and i think think that wraps up magnetostatics yeah is there anything else that we want to get into in the statics regime regime yeah i'm scared to start uh dynamics though because there's a lot to say i mean we can like like emf lenses sure but that we can do those i feel like those are i feel like those are important things so when we get to electrodynamics, mm, this is when this like, is when things get fun. Things start changing. You you ask what happens when you change an electric field over time, Ooh. or you change a magnetic field over time, the first, or over space. Like I mean, it can it can be really any kind of changing. Well, over space. It's, over yeah, exactly. You know, you know, but I'm saying you can still you can still change it, right? Yeah. So I mean, I think I think a really nice way to introduce this is fa- oh my god, I keep doing that. Sorry for the listeners, but uh, uh the fair, three very famous experiments that kind of set a lot of these things in motion is Faraday's three experiments. Faraday is genius individual, must come, 
must come up in our history of physics one of these days. And remember at this time, correct me if I'm wrong, this was in the 1800s? No idea. Okay. <laughs> so this was before relativity. Safe to say this was before relativity. So they didn't really know that A moving from B is the same as B moving from A. N remember this. So these are his three experiments, right? And this was a little bit interesting. So he had a, now again, yeah, this will kind of get you a little bit into, into electrodynamics. So we have a, a loop, right? A coil. Uh, no, actually don't think of a coil. Just think of a loop, like a, a wire, right? A looped wire. And you have a magnetic field, a constant magnetic field. Constant again means static, means uniform, means not changing. I take this loop that again has no electric current. It just, it's, just, it's just a loop, no battery, nothing attached to it. And I pull it, or he, I guess, pulled it through the magnetic field. And he saw that a current was induced. Now, again, the direction of the pull is actually important, but we'll get into that when we need to. But also, there's another detail that you get into it. Is that you have, like, let's say a magnetic field pointing upwards, but that magnetic field stops at a certain point. Right. And what you do is you pull your loop outside of the magnetic right. field. And so the, the important concept here is that what matters is the magnetic flux, right. which the magnetic flux is basically you're adding up. If you imagine all of the B field vectors pointing up through your surface, you're just adding up all the contributions that are piercing your loop. And so if you were to pull it halfway out of the magnetic field, your magnetic flux would decrease by a factor of two. And of course, if your shape is bigger, then you have more flux coming through. If your magnetic field is stronger, then you have more flux coming through. So those are all the things that can uh, affect your magnetic flux. Mm -hmm. Now, remember that what we introduced in all of the static regime was that this should be zero. The flux, which is basically the surface integral, the surface area integral of the magnetic field should be zero because of everything. But however, well, not in this case, the moment we add this varying magnetic field or not really varying, but any real variation. And in this case, even the variation of the position of said wire from the magnetic field, the fact that it's leaving or entering the magnetic field is at one point in time, if we just focus at one point, we are constantly changing the magnetic field at one point, even though the magnetic field of the whole system is constant, we're moving the wire through it. So that change is what uh, sure. I guess, I guess I can use this word right now induces a current in the loop. Now induces current is like a, f uh, like a fundamental of electrodynamics where we understand that magnetic, that changing magnetic and electric fields induce magnetic and electric, no electric and magnetic fields. So a changing magnetic field induces an electric field and a changing electric field induces a magnetic field. Mm -hmm. And the induces is really important because basically what that means is it wouldn't be there if this wasn't there. You know, it, it's only there because you have done this process and it only exists because you have done something to it. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's the first, that's the first experiment. So, <clears throat> right. so you're, you're inducing a current. So... I guess we're uh, obviously not, we're not going to get into the crazy details about this, but current uh, charges moving through a wire um, is proportional to the electric field in that wire, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that uh, Ohm's law or something like that? What V equals I R? Or J equals sigma E? That's not. Is that Ohm's law? I don't know the name of that. Um, I can pull that up right it's here. It's some. It's some. I mean, I have the formula, but I don't know the name of it. I just want to make sure it's right there. yeah j equals sigma e. So basically, so if there's if you have a current, you have charges moving through a wire. It's basically proportional. The proportionality constant is the conduct conducting the coefficient, like how conducting is your thing, and then times the electric field. Like Wait, that. Wait, is that a, yeah, that's that's a thing, right? Conductance, mm -hmm. yeah. No, I'm thinking conductivity. About, conductivity. That is, that is okay, thing. just conductivity. Like, just the, yeah the yeah. Sorry. So electric, essentially think current, think electric field in the wire. And if you have, imagine you're running an experiment, you have a B field and you have a wire with no current going through it. You pull the wire out of the hmm. B field. That means hmm. you're changing the 
magnetic flux through your wire and you see all of a sudden a light bulb turns on, on in, in your thing. So obviously, boom, you have current. Changing the magnetic flux induces a current, aka induces an electric field in your wire. So now you're thinking, okay, I'm changing the magnetic field. I'm creating an electric field. Mm. Now, close your eyes and think about this. Instead of now pulling the wire out of the B field, changing the magnetic flux. Now, think about leaving the wire in the same place, but toning down the B field. You're toning down the B field, decreasing the magnetic flux, but not even moving your wire. Mm. Actually, the same thing would happen. But now you're probably wondering, uh, probably not, but here's a good thing to think about. If you increase your magnetic flux versus decreasing it, does that change the direction in which your current flows? Actually, it does. So mm. I come into Lenz's law where nature abhors change. Is that it? Is no, it? That nature abhors a change in flux. A change That's in flux. quoted from Griffiths. <laughs> quoted from Griffiths. Yeah. And he actually quotes it from somebody that doesn't know who quoted it. But oh. <laughs> anyways, um, so nature yeah, it's, it's abhors like, a oh, change in flux. Fundamental rule. And it's so cool because so cool. you can actually tell which way the current will flow. So here it is. Let's use our right hand rule real quick. Okay. So if you have a B field, what you need to think is I want to keep like the contribution to that B field constant. So if my B field is pointing up through my loop and I decrease the strength of the B field, I'm decreasing the magnetic flux through my loop. What I need to happen is the current needs to flow in a direction that will create a magnetic field to support the magnetic field that you just removed right mm -hmm. so imagine you have two arrows first you have the arrow of the outside magnetic field magnetic field that's pointing up and the second you have an arrow from the magnetic field being created by the current in the loop first what happens is that if your magnetic field is constant then you have zero current which means you have zero uh i'll call it i'll call it b2 the b field of the loop is b2 so first b1 is just full b whatever B2 is zero because there's no current. Now, you're decreasing B1, which means that you're increasing B2. Using the right-hand rule, you can tell that the current has to run counterclockwise because the B field needs to point mm. up. <laughs> so if you're decreasing the, the magnetic field, you're actually running the current counterclockwise. You can do the exact same thought experiment. If you're increasing the B field, then the current has to run the other way to cancel out the, the, the flux that you just created. Mm -hmm. So a nice summary is the induced electric field will always flow in a direction such that it cancels the change in magnetic flux. Right. right. That's like, Lenz's law, I mean, or I guess, yeah, that, that, that's basically the idea. Because remember, it's not the magnetic flux itself that's creating this field. It's not the fact that there is a magnet that's creating the field. It's the fact that you're varying this magnet. So what Parker just described is, the third, is Faraday's third experiment, where he changed the strength of the field. And this also, as you just explained, induces a current in the loop. And the first two experiments were actually the concept of relativity, where in the first one, he pulled a loop through the magnetic field. And in the second one, he pulled a, mag he pulled a magnet through a loop. And it, also induced, the, it mm. also induced the current. Also, another thing that you can do is if you have, like, let's say, a loop that is made of, like, it's wire, but imagine it's, like, it's like uh, elastic, right? right? If you were to start off with just a very small loop, then your magnetic flux has a certain value. But now if you pull the loop open, you're increasing the area through which the magnetic field can flow through. Mm -hmm. You're essentially increasing the magnetic flux. And so you're inducing a current just by pulling the, the, the loop to a so bigger value. So let's talk a little bit more about this induced current. And with this induced current, we get something called the electromotive force or EMF. And these are the two things that I kind of we wanted to talk and about. And it's actually not a force, by the it's way. It's not at all. It's actually more, be, it's, it's better described as a work per unit charge. 
it's it's a, it's a nicer way to think wait, about work it because, per unit charge. Yeah, because it's wait, right? Yeah, I thought, it, I thought it was force per unit charge. No, it's not. That's the whole thing. It's literally not force. Go to the EMF and you will. Yeah, right here. What is it? Emotional EMF. That's a different. That's one. emotional. It should say. It should say right. Well, near the well, definition. if you think about it, you're integrating flux through, so it's just. It's like, the integral of a four. Oh, yeah. No, see. Well, if you just think about it, it's like equal to potential, right? Electric potential is. Oh yeah, it is equal to electric potential. Oh, so never mind. So it's not a. So it is a force per unit. Per unit. No, no, no. That's not even true. Yeah, because E is gradient V, right? V is. Uh, yeah, bro, bro, bro. Joules it's, it's per. It's an integral of force per unit charge. Yeah, so it's not. It's not. Oh, it's force it's per unit charge. Force yeah. Per unit charge. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. So it's joules so it per unit charge. So it is joules per yeah. unit charge. Exactly. Yeah. Because it's the, because it's the integral. Of Wait, that's interesting though. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That, that is interesting. So so again, what the EMF is again not an actual force, but it's basically the the part of the you can think about it as the induced force or the induced work. You can think about it like that, which is why these changing magnetic fields that induce these electric fields those are the ones that then end up doing the work, which is, I think what explained our car example in the very beginning, I could be wrong, please correct me if I am, but I think that's how most of them would work because that's the only aspect that I can think that's actually creating or adding some work into the system or transferring some work. Cause again, magnetic forces can't. So that's mm. basically, that's basically just a quick rundown of it a little is. bit of dynamic charges. It's work done per unit charge. Work done per unit charge. Yeah, but charge. we worked that out. That was a joule yeah, spur. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, there are a lot of other things we can actually talk about, like, you know, self-inductance and, yeah. uh, like, there it's are things a little here, complicated, like mutual though. inductivity. Like, that's actually pretty cool, too. Mutual inductance is pretty cool as well. Mm. That it's, you know, like... Actually, this is a really quick thing. I think I can. I think I can really quickly do this. This is really cool. I, I, I'm just gonna summarize it, not really get into the reasonings because I just want. I just want to say it. Think of loop one and loop two. The flux through loop one from a current flown in loop two equals the flux on loop two from the same current flown from flown. Flow. Flown? No. What, what I, I don't know. What, what, what was I trying to say? <laughs> flowing. In the... Flowing. Flowing in loop one. And this is basically the idea of mutual inductance. Sorry, I'm going to say that again. Flux in loop two with current <laughs> flowing in loop one yeah. equals flux in loop one with current flowing in loop two. And the reason this is so important is because they don't just have to be loops. They can be anything. And the reason that is important is because... Let's say, sim very, very simple example. Let's say we have a small cylinder inside a very long cylinder. To calculate the flux of the small cylinder on the larger cylinder is gonna be nearly, is gonna be crazy because each different part of the smaller cylinder has different contributions depending on where you are in the longer cylinder. But to compute the magnetic flux of a long cylinder, is super simple. Like to compute the magnetic field of a long cylinder inside and outside is super simple just by Ampere's law. So you can apply the same reasoning again with the current now on the other on the other surface and use this simple rule to just kind of switch between surfaces. And I think this is also like a kind of like a understanding that it gives you a little bit more into how these surfaces can be interchanged and, and a little bit more on the concept of these fields. Because that's what's important. It's the fact that they have to be on a surface intermingled with some charge. So, like, they're all closely related to each other. And that's just a little concept of mm. mutual inductance. Not, yeah. again, too essential to electrodynamics. The biggest thing was Lenz's law and the electromotive force. Mm. And... Yeah. Anything else? I think I think, cool. I think I think I think that's basically well, yeah. it. I haven't I haven't touched any of this since uh, exactly one year ago, yeah. so this is a good refresher. Yeah, I mean time. I think mm. I mean you're doing 350 next year. Mm. Um, I think this is a beautiful uh, for anyone that wants to get into any of electrodynamics. Definitely mm. Griffiths is a recommendation because all of this like this episode yeah. wouldn't be possible without Griffiths. Well, if so, you yeah. enjoyed uh, this episode. Make sure to uh, listen to other episodes and maybe tell your friends about it. Other than that, 
why not thank you so much we uh, will catch you in the next time which quick, uh, quick. what about where can they reach us uh, if you email uh, Instagram math, that, like, yeah okay uh, it's all mathphysics.podcast <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, it's all it's, it's, it's I mean it's all in the description below so if you want to go check that out and so, yeah. yeah we're always right. listening to you guys so let us know mm-hmm. and yeah yeah this has been uh, episode 102 long time the coming math and physics podcast everybody uh, and uh, what do I say we'll, we'll see you in the next one I'm your host Parker <laughs> <laughs> And I'm Ray, and we'll see you soon. Bye, guys.